All right, let's get underway now with Psalm 37 to 42. Uh, don't ask me why we broke this at 42 instead of at 41. Uh, in that 42 begins the second book. I think we probably were counting number of chapters and we needed another chapter to fill in and so here we go. Anyway, that's what we're doing tonight. The books uh, are the, uh, the, the book of Psalms is divided into five books and it's so divided in your Bible and if you uh, haven't already looked at that, if you'll turn over between Psalm 41 and 42, you'll see that at Psalm 42 it says book two or the second book of Psalms or something to that effect. They're divided by books. And so the second book starts at Psalm 42. And we'll get back, and you'll see this a little bit later, this, this outline from Dehoff, which Dehoff almost always is a summary if you have his work of Henry Halley. Uh, so if you have both of those, you've got, you've got the same thing. All right, let's talk about, let's go to question number one for tonight and give me a summary of Psalm 37. Say again. All right, the wicked plans come to an end, and they do. Anything else? Question one. Put your trust in the Lord, and that's what this psalm would be about. Uh, Jensen calls this, and I have noted it on the slide, God's just providence. Generally, I have used, if I haven't used my own outline, I've used some of Haley's outlines uh, here in Psalms, and then every once in a while I, I'll jump to Jensen. I like the way Jensen does that, or Scroggy, or uh, W. Graham Scroggy, or, or one of those, and we'll get some of both of those a little bit later. Uh, he calls this God's just providence. Well, let's see what's going on in this Psalm. David is old, apparently, at this point. This is a Psalm uh, of David, and we say he's old because at verse 25 he said, I have been young and now am old. And so we take him at his word. David is an older man, and he's, the question that seems to be pondered is, why do the wicked prosper? That's an age-old question. This is not new with David, nor did it end with David. Why do the wicked prosper? And here I am, living right before God and doing the best I can do, and it seems like I can't get ahead, and everything goes wrong, and it seems like a person living wicked, everything they touch turns to gold. Um, and they don't seem to have some of the problems and frustrations we have. Why? Why is that? So, David ponders that. And his point of the psalm is what? In answer to that question is what I'm meaning. Not... You've read the psalm and some, suppose somebody said, well, I've got that same question. Why do the wicked prosper? And you've read the psalm. Tell me what you learned in answer to that question. The wicked will be taken care of, so just put your trust and your confidence in God. Wait on the Lord. We'll see that as we go through the psalm. Uh, so let's start here at uh, verses 1 to 8, trust in the Lord. And the first point there is, point A, don't fret because of evildoers. Let's stop and talk about this word fret. Do not fret. The word fret means to be agitated. The Holman Christian Standard Bible so translates it. Um, it means to be upset, the new century so translates it. Same word is um, translated in Genesis 30 uh, to be aroused. In Genesis 4, it's translated angry. And so this idea of fretting is just being upset and angry and aroused and bothered and disturbed and agitated because the... the uh, the ungodly seem to prosper while I'm not doing as, as well. I don't think he's just talking about merely they have more money than I have, but they seem, they seem to be living wicked and, and it seems like everything's going well for them and in this life, and yet I, things are not always going well for the righteous. And don't fret about that. So let's get verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers, because, nor be envious of them, because, what does he say at verse 2? going to come to an end. They're going to be cut off. Now remember that cut off here in a moment, and we'll make some point of that in a moment. Now verses 3 to 8 
Uh, Haley labels that as calm confidence. You might underline some things here. Uh, trust in the Lord. Let's put your trust in verse 3 in the Lord. Delight yourself in Him, etc. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. That's part of trusting in the Lord. Committing your way to the Lord. I'm just going to put my, my, my life in the hands of God. And I'm going to do what He says. Uh, look at verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. There's your idea of calm confidence in the Lord. The, the wicked seem to be prospering. Don't worry and fret and be upset about them. The wicked seem like everything goes well for them. Don't worry about that. Don't, don't get upset about that. Just have calm confidence and wait patiently for the Lord. And notice at verse 4, or verse 8 rather, cease from anger and forsake wrath. That's what it means not fretting. Put your wrath away. Don't be upset anymore. Don't fret about that. Don't be upset. Don't be agitated about that. But put your calm confidence in the Lord and the Lord's going to take care of everything. Now let's begin at verse 9. Here's the reasons for the calm confidence. The first is, verses 9 to 15, Yeah, the wicked are going to be cut off. Look at verse 9. The evildoers shall soon be cut off, but those that wait on the Lord shall inherit the earth. Now, I'm going to come back and define inherit the earth in a moment. It's an interesting phrase. But let's just, just, just leave that alone for right now. We're looking at the wicked. The wicked are going to be doomed. For yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. At verse 10. Um, look at verse, uh, verse uh, 12. Um, no, that's not what I want. Verse 13. The Lord laughs because he sees that his day is coming. In other words, the wicked go on and, yeah, it seems like everything's going well for the wicked, but the Lord's thinking, ha, ha, he's going to pay his price. His day's coming. The Lord laughs, and therefore his day is coming. And uh, that's enough to get our point. I'll come back to this inherit the earth here in a moment. I want to get the flow of the context. Now, 16 to 33, here's another reason for the calm confidence. Don't worry about it. Don't get upset about what's going on with the wicked. God's going to take care of them, bring them down, but there's something else God's going to do. And that is ultimately what? The righteous. What God will do for the righteous. Key verse here is verse 16. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of the, of the many wicked. In other words, it seems like this man's living wicked and he just seems to get, get more wealth and more wealth and more wealth and more wealth. And, and that upsets me. No, no, don't fret about that. Because what little you have is going to be far better and worth more than those who are wicked and all their riches. The Lord upholds the righteous. Let's get some key thoughts here. Verse 17. Uh, and, their, uh, and their inheritance shall be forever. The days of famine, they'll be satisfied. Verse 19. Verse 22. Uh, they'll inherit the earth, whatever that means. We'll get to that in a moment. What did he say at verse 25? He had never seen. I've never seen this before. Yeah. Never seen that before, he said. So depart from evil and do good and dwell forever. Verse 27 I'm reading. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. Um, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. That's the way he lives. And the law of the God's in his heart. The Lord will not leave him. Verse 33. Uh, nor, uh, nor condemn him who, when he's judged. And so why, why do I need this calm confidence? God will bring the wicked down and he'll prosper those who are righteous. Now. Start at verse 34. Here is the rest of the psalm, which is basically encouraging people to wait on the Lord. Now, let's, we've talked about this idea of waiting on the Lord. Uh, it is the idea of serving the Lord, but it's, it's this, this idea of waiting calmly and patiently. In fact, this is interesting. That same word translated wait here at verse 34. You might make a marginal note. It's the same word translated with two words in Psalm 40 and verse 1. To, uh, I waited patiently for the Lord. That's interesting. This idea of waiting patiently for the Lord. In other words, I'd like to see the Lord maybe zap this person now because he's so wicked and so ungodly and everybody's praising him. Just wait patiently. Wait patiently. The Lord will take care of him. Does that make sense? The Lord's going to deal with them, so don't, don't worry too much about all of that. Now, look at verse 37. Uh, here in this exhortation to wait on the Lord, one of the things you do is mark the blameless and observe the upright. We often talk about marking those that are ungodly, uh, marking false teachers. There's a sense in which we need to mark righteous people. What does that mean, you mark them? Identify them. Take note of them. Uh, mark the righteous, the blameless man, and observe him. 
And for the future of that man is peace, but the transgressor will be destroyed and the future of the wicked will be cut off. What a contrast. And now notice at verse 40, you want to know another definition of this idea of waiting on the Lord? He, he ends this psalm by saying, because they trust in Him. Put your trust in the Lord, that's part of waiting on the Lord. Now, let's go back to this uh, phrase found in verse uh, 11, verse 9, verse 11, 22, and 34. And that's inherit the earth. In what sense shall they inherit the earth? Some commentators talk, and this may be included in the day of the Psalms, that they will uh, remain, those who are faithful remain in the land, um, in the promised land. I'm not sure that that's what he's talking about here. I take it that it means that he inherits the earth in the sense that he's richly blessed. In other words, he didn't just inherit a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but it's almost like he inherits the entire earth because God so richly blesses him. You say, why do you say that? Well, let's look at verse, verse 11. Um, it, it's a description of peace. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall light them, delight themselves in the abundance of peace. That's an idea of being richly blessed. The peace and inheriting the earth seem to be synonymous. Uh, it is opposed to being cut off. The wicked will be cut off, verse 9, but the righteous will inherit the earth, verse 9. So it's the, it's the opposite of being cut off. These are not going to be blessed at all. These will be richly blessed. Let me show you another phrase that may give us some insight. Uh, chapter 41 and in verse 2. Is this the same phrase? I don't know. Uh, I don't mean is it the same Greek, I mean Hebrew phrase. I'm just saying, is it saying the same thing? I think perhaps so. Uh, the Lord shall preserve and keep him alive and he shall be blessed on the earth. I wonder if that blessed on the earth is not parallel to inherit the earth. I just throw that out for your thoughts. That seems to be that he's just richly, richly blessed. And so the, uh, Jesus quoted that, by the way, the meek shall inherit the earth uh, in his Beatitudes. Well, those who are meek are going to be richly blessed. Uh, not literally inherit the earth, so the earth is all mine. Um, but or it, it's those who are righteous, it belongs to those who are righteous, but... It's, it, we're so richly blessed, it's like, what our, what's our inheritance? It's the whole earth, it's everything. Oh, we're richly blessed. Make sense? All right. That's Psalm 37. Uh, practical things you learn from Psalm 37. All right, yeah, the Lord takes care of His own. What else? Good point. God's got his own timeline. Uh, he'll deal with the wicked, but he'll do it on his terms and in his time. He's not, on my, he's not on my clock. And it's a good thing because my clock may be different from your clock. I think God should have dealt with it yesterday and you thought it was the day before. And God said, I'm not doing either one. I'm going to do it when I'm, I'm ready. That makes sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I won't go through these in detail in interest of time, but here's some characteristics of the righteous found here. The, verse 21, this is from Psalm 37. He shows mercy and he gives to others. That's part of the righteous. His steps are ordered by the Lord. Verse 23, he departs from evil. Verse 27, he does good. Verse 27, he speaks wisdom and the law of God's in his heart. You want to be a righteous person? There you go. There's your characteristics. Make sense? Question number two. Summary of Psalm 38. Heavy burden of sin. You can't read Psalm 38 without seeing that heavy burden of uh, sin. It's a penitential psalm, as we've referred to others, like Psalm 32. We'll see again in Psalm 51. This is very similar to Psalm 51, at least in some phrases. Confession is there. There seems to be suffering uh, at the hands of others in the psalm as well. And thus, Scraggy calls this sin, suffering, and supplication. Um, and I like that. That's why I borrowed that from Scraggy. So let's talk about this burden of sin. This burden of sin, in fact, um, I think this outline is from, the whole outline is from Scraggy. This sounds like the way Scraggy outlines anyway. Uh, the burden of sin, a look within, uh, suffering from others, a look around, and a plea to God, a look upward. So I need to look in, and I need to look around, and I need to look upward. 
And when I look in, there's sin. And when I look around, people are mistreating. And I need to look upward where because that's where my plea and my help comes from. All right, let's make our way through the psalm. Uh, let's talk about this burden of sin. Uh, he makes a plea to God to, in verse 1, basically to turn away your wrath. Uh, if I don't learn anything else, here's a very practical thing, that sin stirs the wrath of God. It's a very, pra uh, it's a very uh, serious matter. Verse 1 tells me that, that sin stirs the wrath of God and he begs God to turn it away. Now, let's go to 2 to 8. I'm more interested here. Why does he say that? Please turn away your wrath because, because of the sin that I have, and that burden is heavy. He pictures sin as not just a little insignificant thing, but it's a heavy burden. How does he describe it? It's as if God's hand pressing down, verse 2. Uh, there's no health in his bone because of his sin. My iniquities have gone over my head. In other words, it's like I'm standing here and, and they started piling up and they're over my head. I'm deep in sin. Uh, this may be, we don't know, but it, it, the language sounds a lot like his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, <clears throat> look at verse 4. Like a heavy burden, they're too heavy for me. Uh, my wounds are foul and festering. Um, I am troubled, verse 6. And so here's just this heavy, heavy burden of sin. And so as I look within, God, please take your wrath away from me because I'm, I have such a heavy burden of sin. Uh, this seems to be a psalm of penitence, as we saw in Psalm 32, and we'll see again in Psalm 51, as I've already mentioned. Now, beginning at verse 9, there seems to be suffering at the hands of others. And so he says... Three things about that. Look at verses 9 and 10. There's comfort in knowing this thought, and that is that God sees and God knows. Now, if you don't take any other lesson home with you tonight, but that one, that's a pretty powerful lesson. That when you're suffering at the hand of someone else, or you think you've been done wrong, just there is some comfort in knowing that my God sees that and my God knows that. I wish somebody in charge, somebody in control knows. Well, he does. It's God. Look at verse 9. Uh, Lord, all my desire is, is before you, and my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart pants and my strength fails. As for the light of my eyes, it also gone from me. All my strength is gone, but you see it. All right. Now then, verses 11 and 12, he's mistreated at the hands of others. What do you see there? 11 and 12. He's got loved ones and friends that stand aloof. His kinsmen stand afar off, yeah. Been forsaken by family and loved ones, sound like Job. There's no comfort, There's no comfort at all. They that seek my life lay snares for me, maybe Absalom, maybe Saul. This better fits Absalom, I think. Um, they plan deception all the day long. Scroggy's comments here are the kin, kin are not always kind. I like that. Kin are not always kind. Just because they're, they're your kin folks and they're your relatives and your loved ones doesn't mean they're always kind to you. David found that out for sure. Maybe you've experienced that as well. Now verse 13 and 14, the third thing he, he talks about here is his reaction to that. What was his reaction? I'm like a deaf man I don't hear. And I'm like a mute man I don't open my mouth. Here's a, here's a very, let's get ahead of verse 7 get a practical lesson. When you are reviled and when you're ridiculed and uh, you, you are belittled, you don't always have to answer. Does that make sense? David said, here was my reaction to how I was being treated. That uh, it's like I couldn't hear it and I wasn't going to say anything. Like yeah, absolutely. Now let's begin at verse 15. Now he looks upward to God, and uh, he has confidence that God will hear. And so I'm just going to leave verse 15 and 16 with that thought because we want to move on. That God's going to hear and God's going to... But what does he say in 17 to 20? Oh, yeah. Look at verse, verse 17. For I'm, for I'm ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. 
my sorrow is continually before me, reminds me of Psalm 51, someone said, yeah. Psalm 51, 4. My sin is ever before me. Remember that? He's talking about this sin with Bathsheba. I think he's talking about the consequence of sin. I don't think he's talking about the guilt there. The, the guilt can be forgiven. This is a penitential psalm. In embracing forgiveness, God forgives. Turn, turn your wrath away from me. But my sin is continually before me. There's consequences that go with sin that last long beyond the guilt being removed. Does that make sense? You steal or you, let's get worse than that. You kill another person. You committed murder. You may have to go to jail and even uh, pay the death penalty for sin that you've committed. Can you be forgiven? Well, sure you can. Can you go to heaven? Yeah. Are there consequences? Yeah, you're still going to pay consequence. David is facing consequence. Now, verse 18 describes this deep sorrow. What does he say? Yeah. That I will declare my iniquity. In other words, I confess my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. I will be in anguish over my sin. What, did that, what does that describe? Deep contrition, deep sorrow. Do you ever think sometimes we repent of something and it's more like, sorry, where there's not deep sorrow for the sin, the grievous sin before God. David, if this is the sin with Bathsheba, said, I am in anguish over that. I have deep sorrow for that. Now, let's get ahead to verse 21 and 22. His plea to God in both his sin and in the, the dealing with others was... What? I need your help. Don't turn away, but I need your help. Practical things on 38, what do you see? All right, good point. What else? Absolutely, absolutely. It'll help you, that deep sorrow, rather than just kind of a, sorry, shouldn't have done that, but deep contrition helps prevent that in the future. Anything else? Yes, yes. My adversary, uh, the, uh, the, those who render evil to me uh, uh, render evil for good because I, f I follow what's good. I'm doing what's right. And uh, All right, let's move on to Psalm 39 now. Psalm 39, what's it about? Summary, question number whatever that is. Um, still question one, part C, I guess. Psalm 39. All right, hope in the Lord. Anything else? All right, he does. He watches all of that. A short psalm here. Uh, Lupo calls this the prayer of a man sorely afflicted. These four major points come from uh, W. Graham Scroggie. Um, Scroggie says this is a man in trouble. But the stroke is not an attack of an enemy, but the correction of a friend. And he talks about that here in just a moment. So let's work our way through the psalm. Four points. Here he's frustrated, his frustrated resolve of silence at first, and then he decides to speak. And then he talks about the humbling brevity of life. Let's talk about this, this resolve of silence. He said that he was determined to do what? I'm going to guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. We could stop and talk about all the practical things there. That's a good study, though that's not going to be our thrust here. That it's possible to sin with the tongue. But he said, I'm going to, I'm going to control my tongue lest I sin with my tongue. And I'm going, to, I'm going to restrain my mouth while the wicked are before me. So I was mute and I was silent. I just decided not to say anything. But, but, verse 3, what's the but? I finally, I had to say something, and I did. So what did he say? Well, that seems to be what verses 4 to 6 are about. 
And that is the, uh, this humbling brevity of life, as Craggy calls it here. And so let's see what he says about the brevity of life. Uh, at least the, in it recognizing punctuation is put in by translators. They are, have translated this at verse 4 as if this is the quotation of what he said with his tongue, now that he finally speaks. And it seems to be. The Lord make me to know my end and the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. And so uh, I, I desire to know. And then the response that, uh, that he gives to himself, which is God's answer to that, is what? Verses 5 and 6. Say again. All right. Days are limited. Notice that he talks about uh, the, uh, uh, certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. And he walks about like a shadow. And uh, so he says that's what life is like. So uh, here's this humbling brevity of life. It, that is humbling to recognize that I'm just a vapor that appears for a little while and then I'm gone. And, and I'm like a shadow that's gone. And uh, so here's this humbling brevity of life. Then he moves in verses 7 through 11 talking about uh, comfort that's born out of hope. In, in view of all of that, notice he says, and you might underline it, verse 7, my hope is in you. I wonder if that's not a contrast to this brevity of life. If I knew I was going to live forever, I might have hope in myself. But instead of that, I have hope in you, he says. What else do we see there in, in uh, verse 8 and 9 through 11? He is seemingly suffering. He's sorely afflicted. And his prayer is to be that that might be removed from him. And, but he says this at verse uh, 9, 10, and 11. I was mute and didn't open my mouth because it was you that did it. Remove your plague from me, and I am consumed by the, the blow of your hand. With rebukes, you correct man for iniquity, and you make the beauty belt away like a moth. Surely every man's a vapor. In other words, he came to recognize, because of the heavy hand of God, uh, the brevity of life. That's one reason it was humbling to him uh, to recognize that. So there's some comfort born from that hope. So finally he ends the psalm as a cry of relief from, from pain. Now notice how he describes himself. How does he describe himself at verse 12? I'm merely a stranger and a sojourner. I'm a passing guest. I'm just passing through. And that's all I am. And so therefore, remove your gaze from me that I may regain my strength. So here's basically a prayer of... Uh, I, I'm not, I don't want to make more of the psalm than, than is there, but it's a prayer of one who is, is sorely afflicted and in pain and some form of suffering. And so he's, he, it humbles him. And, and when, when God allows this to happen to him, that um, he, he comes to recognize the brevity of life. Does that make sense? All right. Now then, Psalm 40. Let's go. Uh, let's see. Is the Anything practical you want to list from Psalm 39 before we leave that one? All right. Boast and trust in the Lord always. We can and must control our tongue, verses 1 and 2. Scroggy listed as a practical lesson. It's better to be silent than to say the wrong thing. That's a good point. It's not wise to complain before the world when we have struggles with God or with our friends. That might be something to learn from this. If I have a struggle with you, I don't need to tell my worldly friends about that. That doesn't help. And if I'm struggling with God over some question, I don't need to tell the world about that because that ain't going to help them. Maybe there's a time to be silent when I'm struggling. Uh, not silent completely, but maybe to certain people, to the world, to my enemies, to, my, to, the, to, the, to the public. I don't need to sound that off. All right, Psalm 40. Give me a summary of Psalm 40. All right. It does deal with patience and it deals with trust, waiting patiently. Um, 
this is, I think, Haley, if I remember correctly, uh, praise for past deliverance and then prayer for present deliverance. Uh, quite often the confidence that we have, let's just forget about the psalm for a moment, quite often the confidence that we have that God's going to hear and answer this prayer we're offering today is because he heard and he answered our prayers in the past. If we've prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing is ever, ever, ever answered and we see no results of a prayer, then we might think, well, he ain't going to listen to this one either. But the confidence is he's listened in the past. So let's talk about that past deliverance in Psalm 40. He starts with God's goodness. Here's that waiting patiently. And he has confidence in God that, that he inclined to me and he heard my cry. Uh, he brought me out of the horrible pit. Um, and so I'll praise God for it. And that's what I see in verses uh, 1 to 5. Now, I want to notice at verse 5, many are his wondrous works. Uh, there's so many, his wondrous things that he's done and the wondrous thoughts that God has had for us that he says at verse 5, they can't be counted by order and uh, they can't be numbered. In other words, we, there's no way you can list all the good thoughts God has had towards you. And so there's just the goodness of God. All right. Now then, his gratitude for God's goodness is going to be expressed two ways. The first is what? In his actions. In other words, obedience. Now, notice he said, sacrifice and offering you do not desire. My ears you have opened. My ears have you opened. Now, take note of that. Because when that's quoted in the New Testament, that's completely changed. That's quoted in Hebrews. That's quoted in, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 5. And this, the quotation in Hebrews neither agrees with the Hebrew nor the Septuagint. It's altered a little bit. Um, instead of saying, um, uh, my ears have you opened, a body hast thou prepared me. Speaking of Christ. So when, when the body was prepared for Christ, that he might use that body to die, that was in harmony with this phrase, my ears have you opened. That my ears have you opened just simply means uh, my ears are open in the sense of willing obedience. It's like someone gives you a command, my ears are open to you. I'm willingly obeying your command. And so this is willing obedience is what this is. And so God doesn't delight in sacrifice and offering if there's not willing obedience. And uh, Notice verse 8, I delight to do your will, O God. So my gratitude for God's goodness is expressed in my willing obedience. Now here's a practical lesson. Do you ever hear anyone say, uh, I know I'm not going to church like I should, and I know I'm not living as I should, but I tell you what, I, sure, I still love God. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Why would I say that? If you love God, finish my sentence. If you really love God and you appreciate His goodness, you will do what He tells you to do. That's what the, the psalmist said. But there's another way He expresses that. How else is He going to show His, his uh, appreciation for God's goodness? Verse 9 and 10. Through words, He's going to tell others. So I'm going to tell others, but I'm going to do it by my deeds. So by my deeds and my words, I'm going to show uh, my appreciation for your goodness. All right. So... There's the praise for the past deliverance. Now then, in verses 11 to 17, uh, here is this prayer for the present deliverance. He talks about how evil surrounds him. Um, I don't think that he's talking, when he talks about uh, I'm surrounded by iniquity, and et cetera, because there's not a, a, a statement of confession seemingly later. I don't think he's talking about I need deliverance from my own sin. But I think he's saying that I need deliverance uh, from all this around me, the corruption around me and the evil around me uh, is what I take it to be. Evil surrounds me. And so then there's this plea for deliverance. Look at verse 13. Please, Lord, uh, uh, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. But the wording a little bit later in verses 14 and 15, it, it's about those that are ri ridiculing him. I don't see a statement of, of, of uh, penitence. Forgive me because I am in deep sorrow but deliver me from this evil around me. I take it the evil that's around him and not talking about his own sin, not in this psalm. Um, anyway, now verses, for what it's worth, you might make a marginal note, verses 13 to 17 is copied 
and repeated where? Seventy a psalm. Uh, psalm 70 is basically the repeat. I'm not saying it's word for word, but it's basically a repeat of verses 13 to 17. So when we get over there to 13 in uh, Psalm 70, you say, well, I mean, I've seen this before. Yeah, you saw it in Psalm 40. Uh, that's not unusual to have that kind of thing done. Uh, we see Psalm 53 will be a repeat of Psalm 14, uh, basically almost word for word. All right, practical things on Psalm 40. If I don't learn anything else, I learn obedience from the heart. One writer said religion is greater than uh, a ritual and conformity should always uh, take precedence over ceremony. I like that. Um, we should submit ourselves to the will of God. Anything else on Psalm 40 before we go to 41? Summary of 41. This is a prayer of a sick man that is beset by cruel enemies. The title that Leopold gives to this. The occasion is some form of sickness. Look at verse 3. He talks about being on the bed of illness and on his sick bed. He has an evil disease. Uh, um, verse 8. So this is a prayer of one that's sick. Short prayer. Um, I'm going to come back. If you're, some of you are copying that, don't get excited. I'm leaving that. I'm going to come back. This is Jensen's outline of that same psalm. He calls it the blessed one, the hated one, and the needy one. You'll see that again. I'm not going to leave that completely. But just for what that's worth to you. Let's talk about this sympathetic man will be blessed. And verse, uh, blessed is the one who considers the poor. And I'm, that's all I'm going to say about verses 1 to 3. Um, that, uh, that summarizes that the Lord blesses the man who is sympathetic. Now, at verse 4, he suffers sickness and hatred from his enemies. So there's a, a, a combination of problems here. And I like the way that this has been outlined. I didn't do this. The scene from the sufferer's bedchamber. Let's notice that. That's in verses 4 to 6. The scene from the bedchamber is... Heal my soul, for I've sinned against you. My enemies speak evil of me. They're saying things like, when, when, when will he die and his name perish? In other words, my enemies are saying, I, we can't wait till he dies. And, and he's pondering this, and, and he's praying to God about the problem that he has. And notice again at verse 3, the Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. I have confidence the Lord will listen to the man on his bed, sick bed. I just have that confidence. And uh, they, they're, they're uh, gathering iniquity and going out and telling all kinds of lies about me. Now, beginning at verse 7, here's the scene from the enemy's council chambers. And what are they saying? An evil disease clings to him. And when he lies down, he, he won't rise up. This may be Absalom he's talking about. And evidence of that, I think, is at verse 9. Then my own familiar friend whom I trust who ate my bread. One that sat at my table and ate my bread. My own son is saying this about me. I take that's who he's talking about. Uh, you may differ, but that's, uh, I won't argue the case. Uh, he's lifted up his heels against me. Uh, and so here's what's going on uh, among my enemies. I'm sick and I'm suffering and my enemies are out and hoping I'll die. And so he's crying out to God. So verses 10 to 12, he turns to God and what does he say to God? He prays for mercy, verse 10. By this I know you're well pleased, because my enemy does not triumph over me. Uh, as for me, he uphold my integrity, etc. So he just prays for deliverance from, from his sickness and from his, uh, from his evil friend, uh, be it Absalom or whoever that may be. Now verse 13, now it may be a conclusion to this psalm. Many think that this is a conclusion to the book First book of Psalms, Psalm 1 to 41. Um, and a conclusion to the book, and that is, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. 
Uh, Jensen calls it a doxology of, the, of book one. The blessed one, the hated one, the needy one, as Jensen outlines Psalm 41. Questions or comments? Psalm 41. We're going to get 42. So we must go. Psalm 42. Psalm 42. What do we have there? Summary. Here is a man who is, he's desperate, he's longing for God. Some say this psalm is about longing for the sanctuary. Others say perhaps both. Let's see what we have here. We're starting now in, and again, because I think we, I don't remember why we did that, why we brought 42 into this trimester when it goes through the next section, but I think we were counting numbers of psalms and we needed six to match the other, so here's our sixth psalm. Uh, be that as it may, we're starting into the second book, and as Dehoff outlines that, this deals with Israel. More about that perhaps next week. A longing for God, as uh, Haley outlines it here. There's the, the soul thirsting for God, and then I'll remember God. Uh, this seemingly, this by the way is by the sons of Korah. This is not a psalm of David. Uh, this was uh, a descendants of Levi. They were uh, a guild of singers. They uh, were keepers of the gates of the sanctuary, 1 Chronicles 9. And so this is by the sons of Korah. Now, we don't have time to go in depth on the psalm. Our time is about out. But I want to drop to verse 4. He longs for the sanctuary. Um, and uh, there's a question here. Some suggest, and it very well may be, that perhaps he's being uh, prevented from going to the temple at the time of, uh, of, uh, uh, of feast time. And he remembers the time when he used to go. Uh, if any of you have Blackmore uh, on Psalms, that's the one in the Truth series, uh, Truth Commentary series. Black, the Blackmores make this observation that the Hebrew here could be translated in past tense, I had gone. And that's how it's worded in the New King, I mean, New King James, King James, New American Standard, etc. Um, but they're saying that Alexander suggests that this very well could be future in the sense that and in that view, it would, it would not say that I used to go I, or I had, I had gone in the past to the, to the, and I long for that, but I will in the future. I will continue. In other words, I will pray to God about these things. I suggest you look at Blackmore. It doesn't, they don't say a lot, but they do give the, the alternative rendering and uh, loophole and others don't say much about that. Anyway, uh, whatever the case may be, his soul is longing for God. Now, there is this dispute, and, and um, it was at Lupo makes this observation. Is it talking about longing for God or longing for the sanctuary? And I'm not, this is not a direct quote, but a paraphrase basically that Lupo suggests a longing for God that doesn't also long for his sanctuary isn't much longing for God. And I agree with that. One who says, I want to love God, but I don't care anything about his sanctuary. I don't care anything about being in worship to him. I don't care anything about his temple. I don't care anything about going to the temple or being with those who are serving God. Is not much love for God. And so this kind of inseparable. Does that make sense? So let's quickly notice a couple of things and our time is gone. Uh, he said, my soul pants for, for you as, as a deer pants for water. Uh, he has tears as he's taunted. But again, verse 4, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go to, uh, with the multitude. I went uh, with them to the, to the house of God. Again, it may be, I used to do that and I'm prevented now, or I will, when I go again, I'm going to go in the future. I'm not sure. I'll leave that for you to decide. And then verse 5 just basically says, I'm discouraged, but I have hope in God. I have hope and I trust in God. And so he ends the psalm basically saying, I will remember God. Now, quickly hit that. For those that will be here in this class next week, this psalm and Psalm 43 were originally one psalm. And so it goes together. So we can't study 43 without knowing something of Psalm 42. So I know that was a hurried look at that. That was supposed to be a view of Psalm 42, but that's a quick look. We're going to go back and hit 42 and tie it with 43 next time. We're done.